Now for today's program. Dr. Paul Root Walpe is the Raymond Shenazi Distinguished Research Chair of Jewish Bioethics, Professor of Medicine, Pediatrics, Psychiatry, and Sociology, and the Director of the Center for Ethics at Emory University. Dr. Walpe's scholarly work focuses on the social, religious, and ideological impact of technology and biotechnology on the human condition. He is Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Bioethics, Neuroscience, and sits on the editorial boards of over a dozen professional journals. Dr. Wolpe also writes and speaks on topics of Jewish thought. He has worked as bioethics advisor to the Victor Center and to JScreen around issues of preconception genetic carrier screening among Jews. For 15 years, Dr. Wolpe served as the senior bioethicist at NASA. He is a frequent contributor and commentator in both the broadcast and print media, appearing on shows like 60 Minutes and on PBS, as well as the Science Times of the New York Times. Ali Rogan is a producer and correspondent with the PBS NewsHour. She previously worked at ABC News and NBC News. During her senior year at New York University, she discovered she had the BRCA1 genetic mutation and decided to have prophylactic surgery before her graduation in 2009. She wrote her first book, Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, in 2020. Joining Dr. Walpe and Allie Rogan is Emily Goldberg. Emily is a genetic counselor for the J-Screen program. Before joining J-Screen, she worked as a genetic counselor at Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York, specializing in prenatal and cancer genetics. She serves as an instructor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and adjunct faculty at Sarah Lawrence College. Please welcome Dr. Paul Root Wolpe, Ali Rogan, and Emily Goldberg. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and hi, everyone. Um, this is a topic that I think I can speak for Paul, Ali, and I when I say we're really passionate about and we're excited to um, share a little bit about our experience. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Um, as Suzanne said, I'm a genetic counselor at JScreen. So for anyone who's not familiar with us, JScreen is a national nonprofit, and we're based out of Emory University. And our goal is to educate the community about genetic testing and the importance of genetic testing and counseling. We also provide genetic te testing and counseling for hereditary cancer and reproductive carrier screening. And it's a national program, and it's all done from home. Um, and I think our goal today is just to talk a little bit about genetics. But more than just the science, we'll focus a little bit on the ethics, um, you know, look at it through a Jewish lens. You'll hear a really personal story, um, which Ali will share. And um, as you heard, we're happy to answer any questions as they come through. So feel free to put those in the Q&A. So I think I want to pass it over to Paul for a minute just to get a little bit of perspective about what is an ethicist and, you know, what do you do in your your day-to-day -day life and how is that related to genetics? So it's interesting because what I think an ethicist does changes for me all the time uh, because it's such an interesting profession to be in and people ask all different kinds of questions. Around issues of genetics, we're talking about individuals wanting to understand their own genetic history and perhaps do preconception testing and things like that. But of course, the ethics of genetics is much broader than that. It goes to cloning and stem cells and questions of how we should manipulate the very plasms of human life, which we're able to do now to an extraordinary degree. So uh, when it comes down to the questions we're talking about specifically today, I think my job is, to, is not that different than yours, uh, Emily, in the sense that I try to ask questions to get people to elucidate their own ethical feelings about things rather than trying to deliver ethical answers. And I know genetic counselors feel the same way about the, these things. Um, and, you know, every once in a while I'm asked my ethical opinion about things and I'm happy to give my ethical opinion about things, but I don't think it's privileged just because I'm an ethicist. In other words, I think everybody needs to make these kinds of ethical decisions for themselves and in issues of genetic testing, um, and other genetic issues. The questions can be quite complicated. They can be ethically, I mean, sorry, emotionally very fraught. And um, so it takes, uh, it takes a lot of careful thinking to try to untangle some of these thorny issues. 
Well, when you put it that way, it does make our job seem really similar. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of taking some of this information and putting it into a way that people can understand and, and digest and, and make decisions that are gonna, that are gonna mm -hmm. be right for them. And, and one more point, and that is, <clears throat> Jews have thought about these questions for a very, very long time. The questions change, obviously. The technology changes and technology creates new questions. Technology is one of the most powerful um, generators of new ethical questions in general. I mean, from the creation of movable type to genetic uh, mm -hmm. uh, engineering. So, um, but the, very, the principles that underlie the questions we're asking have been thought about in the Jewish community for thousands of years. So we have an incredibly rich tradition to draw from to try to uh, illuminate some of these issues. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I want to bring Allie in. So, um, Allie, I'd love if you could just share a little bit more about your story and sort of what drove you to share it with everybody, um, you know, both in talks like this, but also through your book. Yeah. So when I was 18 years old, um, my parents sat me down and said that my father was a carrier of the BRCA1 genetic mutation. Um, and he found out because his sister had tested positive for it, she passed away of ovarian cancer. So there was a very clear family history on my dad's side of the family. Um, and I know that's something that uh, speaks to some of the misconceptions that um, this genetic mutation can be passed down from either side. My parents gave me the option of they completely deferred to me on what I wanted to do with that information. I got tested immediately. Um, I was lucky that um, uh, I was actually maybe a little bit older when they told me because I ended up being able to get tested right at the NYU Medical Center. Um, and I did that right away because I thought the least I can do right now is find out if I'm also a carrier, which can inform my decisions later on. And of course, BRCA1 increases a woman's risk of breast cancer to somewhere around 80%, also increases her risk of ovarian cancer. There are also links to other cancers, including um, colon cancer, uh, and the risks among men also include prostate cancer, which my father is also a survivor of. So before my senior year, um, it was at, yeah, it was actually before my senior year that they told me and that I got tested. And I found out I was positive. And this was uh, in 2008. So actually 2007. Sorry, it's all kind of a blur, but I was pretty young. I was in college. Um, uh, it's all in my book, um, the exact dates, <laughs> which we did fact check. Um, but I uh, had met with a genetic counselor. And this was really before a lot of um, the, this was pre-Angelina Jolie. So there was a lot of mystification around what BRCA1 really meant, around what the options were. So my genetic counselor really emphasized early uh, uh, rigorous surveillance and early detection. Um, MRIs and uh, uh, mammograms alternating every six months so that any irregularities can be detected early. I left that meeting really scared that that was my only option because to me, it sounded very, um, uh, allowing, just waiting around for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a proactive kind of person. So it wasn't until I went to get a second opinion from a surgical oncologist that I was told that more and more young women were seeking prophylactic surgery. I actually got it done on spring break of my senior year. I had my reconstructive surgery a few months later, and it was the best decision I've ever made. Um, I would say that certainly um, there are many uh, individuals who choose early surveillance and uh, surveillance and early detection, um, but I think it underscores the importance of the genetic counselor's job in guiding patients through their options to make sure they're fully apprised so that that way they can make a decision. And I felt like in my case, I was done a disservice at that time um, because I wasn't um, being made fully aware of all of my options. Of course, again, that was a long time ago and the environment has certainly changed. Mm -hmm. I wish J-Screen had been around at that time because I'm sure I would have benefited from it. 
but now I'm here and I'm able to talk about my story and hopefully help others going forward. And well, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think it really is amazing how much things like social media um, and webinars are able to really expand our knowledge and people can set up support systems and reach out to other people who have been in similar situations. Um, so even aside from all the technology and information that we know now about BRCA1 and other hereditary cancers, just being able to connect with people um, who have been through a different experience, I think is just invaluable. Now, what would you say to somebody who um, is sort of at that point right now when they're thinking about genetic testing um, or maybe recently found out they're positive? What do you think would be helpful for them to know as they're starting their own journey? Me? Yes, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. I would say, and the thing I do say, because I, I get asked a lot by people who are about to go down this road, is knowledge is power. Um, the knowledge is out there. So why wouldn't you do what you can to avail yourself of it? And from there, you can make any decision you want. Um, I have talked to people who say, I don't, I don't know if I want to get tested. And for me, that's, that's, that's the only bad choice you can make is if you have indica indicators that you should be tested and you decline testing because that information is important first and foremost for yourself, also for your children, for your family members. Um, and then from there, my immediate advice is of course, and I think now this is required, but get with a genetic counselor who can walk you through your options. And then when I'm talking to women who are considering um, prophylactic surgery, um, you know, I was really happy with the results of my double mastectomy. And so uh, I've met with lots of young women and I've taken them into the bathroom of the restaurant and I've shown them the results to say, look, it's, you know, the, the, the least important part of this is the reconstruction uh, process. And that's not to say it's not incredibly important and it's important to feel comfortable with your surgeons and, and feel good about yourself, feel good about how you, how you look. However, um, that for me, the fact that I was getting my breasts removed was, um, the, was not the main thing. The main thing for me was that I was dramatically reducing my risk. Mm -hmm. And you had seen your grandmother who passed away from cancer um, and, you know, potentially other people in the family who had gone through these treatments. So it sounds like you felt for you, prevention is way more than any kind of treatment would have been sort of after the fact. Absolutely, it was, it was worth all of the anxiety of waiting for those results. Um, it was incredibly important and um, it's informed a lot of my decisions going forward. And of course, in a few years, I'm gonna have to um, contemplate removing my ovaries because that's the next step for uh, BRCA1. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll do that with the same attitude that I brought to this, which is, the number one thing that uh, guides my decisions in this context is staying healthy and staying alive. Absolutely. Um, and you touched on something that I think is something that Paul can really speak nicely to is about, you know, sort of this duty to do testing if you know that you're at risk um, and, you know, both for your own health, but also other people in the family. Um, and kind of how to sort of battle that duty to get that information, but also sometimes if somebody is hesitant or nervous about getting that information. Yeah, I think it, things were different <clears throat> earlier on in the history of genetic testing, where we still had a lot of questions about what its implications might be, about things like um, in, uh, insurance and employer discrimination, which someone asked about in the Q and A, and I quickly typed out that that's illegal now because of the GINA Act, because of the Genetic Insurance uh, Non Discrimination Act. But I think we've come to the point now where most of those questions have been cleared up. I was hesitant I, earlier in my career to tell people I thought it was a duty, and I think I was right. I mean, I think we really had to make sure that this was a process that was safe and effective, that it didn't have a lot of what I call collateral damage, that is, you know, families finding out. And, and have, But I think we've come to the point now where we can safely say that, you know, if you come from a, a family that has risk, 
um, it's important that people get tested because we have really effective testing now. We're, we're very confident that the results we give people are accurate. Um, we have uh, many different kinds of measures that people can um, think about to uh, avoid having a, a child that's infected with the particular, affected by the particular disease. We have ways to manage family in, families and family information so that people don't get collateral information that they don't want accidentally or without thinking about it first. So in that sense, I think of genetic testing as mature now. And because it's mature now, I'm much more comfortable than I was 20 years ago saying, yes, I think it's ethically important that people get tested if they're at risk. Uh, when my daughter got married, I gave her J screen test as one of the many wedding presents I gave her, but I said, this is, this is an important one. Um, if you don't do it now, you know, do it certainly before you plan to conceive. Uh, but I want you to have the option starting now. And I, uh, I've, all, I've often encouraged people to give it as a wedding present. I think it's a really wonderful way. I always say grandparents should give it, by the way, but that's a different story. That's just my, I think it's just a wonderful thing to come from grandparents. When it comes from parents, it looks a little, can look a little pushy. When it comes from grandparents, it, it just looks loving. So, um, so but in any case, um, yes. So I do think it is, uh, I, I do think it's something that we have a, an ethical obligation to do to protect our children. And speaking of risk, so, I think before we get too far down this road, I just want to give a little bit of a background, just in case people are not as familiar with hereditary cancer. Um, so everybody has these genes that are what we call tumor suppressor genes. So they're genes that function in our bodies to protect us from cancer. So they're like security guards. They're on the lookout for our cells acting up and growing out of control, and they try to fix it before it becomes a problem. So everybody has these genes. But if there's a genetic change in one of these genes and it makes it not work right, then that gene can't do its job. So people who have these hereditary genetic changes lose some of that protection against cancer. So as Ali said, then you know with BRCA1 specifically, there's a higher risk for breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate um, cancers because of that loss of protection. Um, now in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, we find that about one in 40 people are carriers for a genetic change in either BRCA1 or BRCA2. And that's about 10 times higher than the general population. So anybody, regardless of background, regardless of sex, can carry a genetic change in one of these hereditary cancer genes, but it is more likely when someone is Jewish. Now, knowing that chance, um, and I think this is a good question for Paul, is being Ashkenazi enough of a risk to consider doing genetic testing? I think it's enough of a risk to consider it. I'm not always sure it's enough of a risk to compel it. That is, I think anybody with an Ashkenazi background, Jews or non-Jews, by the way, because as we know, many Jews, um, you know, th there were intermarriages, there were conversions. So there are people with Ashkenazi background who are not Jewish and Jay Screen is very careful about that fact. Um, but I think anybody with an Ashkenazi Jewish background should think about it because we have a strong founder effect, which is just the fancy way of saying that we're very interrelated to each other. We have a genome that is less diverse than the genome of other populations because we have married within our own population so often over the years. And, that ha and so when there are weaknesses in a genome and, that, and the um, population sta intermarry stays within itself, those weaknesses can be multiplied. And so they are a potential problem with that throughout the Ashkenazi community. And there are a number of them. I don't know, Emily, you probably can tell us what the official count of the you know, Jewishly oriented disease, genetic diseases are right now. It changes over time and depends where you put your threshold. But anyway, there are a number of them. So yeah, I do think it is something that people with an Ashkenazi background should consider. Um, and historically for genetic testing, you know, cancer in particular, though this applies to a lot of areas of genetics and medicine, uh, from a historical perspective, it was very difficult for the general public to access genetic testing. 
because BRCA1 and 2 testing, you know, around the time that Allie did it was five to six thousand dollars if it wasn't covered by insurance. Even if it was covered, there could still be some large out-of-pocket costs. And there were very specific criteria that people had to meet from their insurance company in order to have that considered being tested. Um, and what's amazing about how far technology and genetic testing has come is that the price has come down a lot um, and awareness has gone up. So it has become a lot more accessible when previously it wasn't. And so there's a school of thought that says everybody should have access to this genetic testing, or maybe everybody should consider it at a certain age or anybody that wants it should be able to do it regardless of background. Because we know that if we just stick to those strict guidelines, um, we probably miss about half of people who carry one of these genetic changes. Um, so I see that there's some questions in the Q&A about if somebody doesn't have a lot of information about their family history, whether their relatives died in the Holocaust, whether somebody's adopted, or they're estranged from their family members, they're sort of missing that piece of information about, you know, maybe what screenings they should do or what ages those would be recommended. And genetic testing can kind of serve as one extra piece to add back in. So even if there's not a complete history about a lot of relatives, by doing genetic testing, you can at least bypass some of that. It doesn't replace, um, you know, all recommendations for screening based on someone's history and age and other risk factors, but it can really give people back some of the things that they're missing if they don't have a lot of family history information. Um, and yeah, so Allie, there's some questions in here and I'm happy to help with these about, um, you know, having children versus removing the ovaries. And just to give a little bit of background. So the reason why we recommend that people have their ovaries removed when they're at risk for ovarian cancer, like from a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, is because we're not great at screening for ovarian cancer. And so by the time we find it, it's often advanced. Whereas with something like breast cancer screening, even though, as Ali said, it doesn't lower somebody's risk to do breast cancer screening, it doesn't prevent cancer, um, but the idea is that if you're doing screening, you can find it earlier, it can be more manageable and treatable. Um, so some people will choose screening, um, some people will choose surgery, and that often depends a little bit on um, you know, their age, their other health factors, if they're healthy enough for surgery, their personal you know, experience with cancer in, in their family and their personal preferences. But with ovarian cancer risk, um, we're just not great at screening for it. So we recommend, at least for now, I think this will change in the next decade, that people remove their ovaries as prevention because we're not great at screening for it. Now, the timing of that is when someone's done having kids. Um, and Ellie, I want to pass this back to you, you know, to share a little bit about how some of this information can be useful in terms of planning for a family and some of the different options that people might have. Yeah, um, it's a very timely question for me because I am currently on this journey or part of the journey. Um, so when I, it's been drilled into my head since I began testing for this, um, understanding my risk that I need to remove my ovaries by age 40 or when I finish childbearing, whichever comes first. I'm 34 right now, and I'll get to it in a second, but I'm probably gonna finish childbearing, hopefully a little bit before that. Uh, I'm not sure how much, um, but I'm very mindful of the fact that the next step in this is uh, having an oophorectomy. Um, and I believe now the recommendations are actually evolving as to whether or not to get a full um, I think like a radical hysterectomy, which includes the uterus, but I'm not an expert in that. So let me step away from that. Um, I, my husband and I um, started trying to conceive when I was 33. Uh, and frankly, I think a lot of my, uh, the, the kind of the mental space I was in when I started this was really anxiety riddled because I was so focused on getting pregnant so that I could begin 
the process of removing my ovaries. Long story short, a year later, nothing was happening. Um, so we then went to a fertility specialist, um, mainly because we were having trouble um, conceiving uh, without outside help. And this, the secondary reason was because I thought, hey, if we're going down this path anyway, I might as well do pre-implantation genetic testing of any embryos that we, um, that we fertilize. Um, interestingly, this doctor, this wonderful doctor, um, said when I mentioned BRCA1, he said, yeah, that's, I assumed you were here because you're a BRCA carrier, not because of anything else. Lots and lots of people these days um, are, um, are choosing this kind of testing to be able to screen out the mutation in their children. Um, parenthetically, it's extremely expensive. We were very lucky that we had excellent fertility coverage. Um, and, but that's not the case for everybody. So the barriers remain incredibly high. And that's another thing we could spend an hour talking about, but we were lucky. I was able to do four rounds of egg retrievals. Um, and we were blessed with, um, seven healthy BRCA, BRCA normal, um, embryos. And, um, a few, about a month ago, we had our first embryo transfer. Um, we were able to, um, we didn't want to select the sex this time around because we just wanted whichever was the healthiest looking embryo that had the best chance of resulting in a live birth. Um, but we found out it's a girl and right now I'm about um, just under seven weeks pregnant, um, which I know is incredibly early and that people are advised not to talk about it. Um, I have my own issues with that because I think that's a very um, antiquated way of thinking about how we talk to one another as humans and how we share what's happening in our lives. Um, but uh, because this process was so arduous, um, we're, we're sharing it as um, a milestone and something to celebrate in and of itself. So um, the, the situation around, um, you know, more and more people that I know have done um, PGT, which is pre-implantation genetic testing, um, for the express purpose of um, rooting out the gene, um, even if you were able to conceive uh, without help. Um, the other part of this though, is I personally don't think I would have pursued this option if I hadn't otherwise needed assisted reproductive technology. I think that in 20 years, by the time any of my children are grown to the point where they're facing these decisions, I am sure that the technology will continue to advance to a place where it's not, um, th th there are more options to deal with this. And I didn't um, necessarily view it as a life debilitating mutation. It was certainly something that I needed to take preventative action to address, but it wasn't something that was going to ruin my life. And I didn't think it would ruin any life of uh, any child I bring into the world. But for right now, it's still an ancillary benefit. And I'm thrilled that we're able to um, take control of our genetic destiny in this way. And that kind of all circles back to what you said in the, in the beginning, which is, you know, knowledge is power and, um, you know, deciding whether or not you wanted to test the embryo, you know, you were able to make that informed decision by knowing ahead of time that you were a carrier for that mutation. Yeah. And I should note that even if you do have a, uh, a mutation, you don't necessarily need to test mm -hmm. for it if you're doing IVF. Um, but it was a wonderful option that, that we jumped at. You know, we thought it's a no brainer if we're already doing this. Amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I think you're right. I think, you know, in 20, 30 years, when the next generation is starting to think about this, I think our technology is going to look a lot different, our cancer prevention and detection. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty interested to see what things look like down the road. I always say that, you know, when our children grow, you know, are older, you, my grandchildren now have grandchildren, you know, you're going to go to your physician and they're going to have your whole genome on their computer. I mean, oh, uh, you know, in, between now and then, you'll have a maybe a DNA chip or a card that you swipe that gives your you know your whole genetic information to a healthcare provider. But this, it's already happening. Genetic information will become a normal part of healthcare. Your mm -hmm. genetic information will be part of your provider's considerations when they think about how to treat you because. It's not just the questions we're talking about, like cancer genes. For example, 
different drugs metabolize in the body differently depending on your genome. So personalized medicine, which is becoming very big now, is one of the things it looks at is if I give Ali Rogan this drug, how will her particular genome metabolize it over time? So maybe she needs a different dose than Emily Goldberg does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the idea that the genome is this secret thing that we don't want people to know because we'll be discriminated against, that's very, that's passing. And I think genetic information will just be part of an integrated way that we look at people's health. And we'll sort of reveal different information about the genetics at different ages as that information becomes relevant. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and it will empower people to make all different kinds of decisions about their health. I mean, we know people who, you know, smoke their whole life, drink their whole life and live to 150. And then you know, nobody lives <laughs> 150. It's a little exaggeration, but I mean, they live a nice long life. And then there are people that, you know, seem to be much more cancer prone or, or health um, uh, problem prone. And we may find and we've already found some genetic markers for some of those kinds of things, but we may find other genetic markers that let us know what kinds of behaviors, for example, are particularly problematic for us, given our gene. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of leads us a little bit into, I want to touch on certain misconceptions. Um, and I think that'll help clarify some of the questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A about genetic testing and about hereditary cancer. Um, and one is that this is for men and women. Um, so as Ali said in the beginning, you know, her genetic change is inherited from her dad's side. Um, and it's important to look at both sides of the family. We can inherit these from either parent. We can pass them down to children regardless of sex. Um, and even though the, the risks can look a little bit different, so with BRCA1, for example, um, you know, there's a risk for females to have ovarian cancer and there's a risk for males to have prostate cancer. Um, so it's important for both men and women to be aware that they may carry these genetic changes and they may, may be at risk for different things, even though, you know, you often hear about it in terms of breast cancer or ovarian cancer risk. Men can get breast cancer, men may have different risks. Even if it's something that they may not be at risk for, if they have children, they can pass those on. Um, so it's not just, let me focus on mom's side of the family and that'll inform my breast cancer risk, but to really look at both sides of your genes. Um, and, and also, you know, we've talked a lot about BRCA1 and 2 in terms of hereditary cancer, but we know that since the time Allie was tested, that those were the only genes that we were testing for that were related to hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, but now genetic testing, we've learned about so many other genes that contribute to cancer risk, not just breast and ovarian, but colon, uterine, kidney, brain, stomach, lots of different types of hereditary Pancreas. cancer. Um, and, and now we're almost exclusively doing what are called panels, which means you're not doing one gene at a time anymore you're testing for multiple genes all at once. So for example, with JScreen, we test for 63 genes all at one time. And we're not just saying, okay, there's only breast cancer in your family. So we're just gonna test genes we know with a breast cancer risk. And really what we're finding is that people carry genetic changes that tell them that they're at risk for things. And it may not have been seen in the family before, or maybe they have a small family. Um, and so, the technology is there and cheap enough and accessible enough that when someone's looking at one gene, they can really look at a lot of different genes that's going to give them a more complete picture. So had Allie's family, you know, been tested in the past and they were negative, but they had this family history of ovarian and, and prostate cancer, uh, had they circled back through now, we'd say, you know what, it may be worth retesting, not because your genes have changed, but because we can look at more things. Um, so genes never change over our lifetime, but the technology gets better. We learn more about how to look for different genetic changes. We learn more about how all of our genes work together. Um, and so sometimes, you know, we circle back with, with our patients um, to, to let them know about, you know, new things that have come up. 
Let me, let me say something about that before, because this is really, really important. You can go out and you can get genetically tested by a lot of companies now out on the market. There's nothing more important in my view about genetic testing than having skilled and competent genetic counselors who can explain to you what that genetic testing means. I can't tell you how many times people have asked me questions about genetic testing or gene, genes uh, or findings that they've had where they just so completely misunderstand either what testing is or what the results mean. So it's really the, the reason that I'm so passionate about JScreen is because it's such, they're so careful about making sure that a genetic counselor is part of the process so that you really understand what those results mean. And I can't emphasize enough how important I think that is. I actually think it is unethical to offer anyone genetic testing without a strong genetic counseling program. Um, and not that I'm biased at all being a genetic <laughs> counselor, but I definitely agree. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot over my years of practice about people who have misinterpreted genetic testing um, and have had preventive surgeries that they didn't need, or they were told the wrong information about the genetics of their pregnancy um, and things like that. And, um, you know, genetic testing has changed so much and there's so much to it that Literally, I have a full-time job just keeping up with it. Um, and, and there's a lot of genetic tests out there, but they're not all created equal. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just because somebody has had a genetic test for something, um, if you're not there with someone who understands the differences and the nuances of testing um, and making sure that you're being tested for the right thing, it's really not going to help you. Um, and really could be harmful if it's if it's not the right test and it's not ordered in the right way. If I can put in a small plug for my book, which is Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss. Um, uh, in it, I interview women um, throughout all different phases of the breast cancer experience. And of course, beating breast cancer in, in this context does not mean becoming cancer free for the rest of your life. It means overcoming it and, and living your life on your terms to the best extent you can, even if you're dealing with it actively. Um, and I track women from um, taking prophylactic action to women who've had multiple recurrences. But I interview women with all different genetic mutations. I was very surprised that only one of them actually had the BRCA mutation. Actually, it was the BRCA2 mutation. The others I talked to had um, check 2 NED, I think it's called, PALB1. Um, I know I'm, I'm yep, missing up the so, Yeah, yeah, I, I'm messing up the alphabet soup. But I was surprised. <laughs> a lot of letters. Yes, a lot of letters in this. But I was surprised the variety of mutations that the women that I spoke to in this book um, had uh, had presented. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, sometimes somebody has breast cancer and they come through for testing and we say, you know, we didn't find anything relating to your breast cancer, but you've got this high colon cancer risk. And so we've got to also make a plan for your colon cancer screening and, you know, and preventive measures. Um, and so that sort of reminds me of, of another misconception that people have is sometimes people say, I've already had cancer, so genetic testing is not going to help me at this point. Um, and what I tell them is it really, it can make a big difference. Um, so knowing somebody's genetic status can inform their treatment. So it can help them decide about, you know, if they're on the fence about having a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy, knowing the genetic status can help. Um, there are some new medications that actually target cancers that have certain underlying genetic mechanisms. So they, they can actually be offered different medication depending on their genetic status. Um, they might be at risk for other types of cancer. So even though, you know, their breast cancer may be in the past, there may be other things we'd recommend for them, like with their ovaries or their colon cancer risk, that would be helpful to know to keep them healthy in the future. Um, and I think as Ali said in the beginning, it's not just your information, right? It's important for your family. Um, and I think, you know, one part of Judaism is sort of that duty, not only to take care of ourselves, um, but also to protect other people and to kind of share this information with other relatives who may be at risk because we may be saving their life too. Right. And in fact, yeah. And in fact, um, 
this is, as I say, we're in a transitional period now, I think. And that is people volunteer to get these. And we see from some of the questions in the Q&A, people are worried about these. But as we move forward, this everybody is going to have this information about themselves and about their loved ones. And <clears throat> unless you very specifically don't want it, which is kind of like saying, I don't want to know if I have high blood pressure or I don't want to know if I have diabetes. I mean, we just take it for granted that if I have diabetes, I want to know about it. If I have high blood pressure, I want to know about it because we can do things about them. Genetic information will soon be in that same category. It will just be normal information that we get as part of our healthcare, um, as part of the healthcare process. It'll give us information about what kinds of steps we have to take, whether we have to get our colonoscopies once every five years or once every 10 years or whatever it might be. Um, and that's just going to be a normal part of healthcare in this country and, you know, in many places with um, advanced medical systems very soon, I think. So a lot of these questions are transitional questions that are happening because it's a relatively new technology. And it takes a little time to integrate a technology and know how to use it correctly. But I think we're over the hump in that way. And, uh, and it's, it's now becoming a very, very sort of normal part of healthcare. Yeah, and a lot of this extends to, you know, other areas of medicine, like when I started as a genetic counselor, it was really, you know, you could focus on the prenatal area or the cancer area or pediatric, and now we see genetic counselors in cardiogenetics and neurology and um, ocular genetics and all these different areas where we're learning just so much more about how genetics can play a role. Um, and, and I think also people can, can be their own advocate. You know, if they say, why is it that I've had four generations of people in my family pass away really young from heart disease, right? And those questions weren't really answerable by genetics other than saying it runs in the family. But now there's actually genes that you can go and test for and figure out who's at risk and who's not at risk um, and, you know, really make actionable differences to to their health to kind of like fight up against the genetics if we know about it, if we have that knowledge in advance. I'm just checking the Q&A for a minute. Um, so somebody in the Q&A is saying that, you know, there's, if there's a family history of breast cancer and the family did BRCA testing and it was negative, are there reasons for other people in the family to do testing? Um, and I think it, the answer used to be no, because, you know, if we couldn't find a specific genetic cause for them, then we probably can't find it in their sister, cousin, son. Um, but the answer now would be, you know, for the family to sort of circle back, look to see what testing they've done, how many genes it was, and sort of revisit it. Because if it was a while ago and it was a limited number of genes, it may be worth circling back. Um, now, Paul, are there other questions that you commonly get from an ethical or, or Jewish perspective that you feel like is an important yeah, so I think that we haven't really touched on. So there, there, there are some things I think that that people. I, I don't think there is much uh, problem with genetic testing for cancer. I don't think any. Um, I've never heard a Jewish um, uh, objection to genetic testing for cancer. Most of the Jewish conversation was around preconception genetic testing. But I will, well, I will say this: this is something we know, but I'm not sure all of our listeners know. One place where there, where there is, has been conversation and where there is general consensus is in testing children, where the consensus there is we don't test children for general susceptibilities for cancers that might occur later in life. We might ch test children for cancers that, or for, for any condition that would affect them as children, but you don't test underage children with big cancer panels, because you just want to know if they're going to get cancer 50 years from now, we, we ethically have, we have decided as that 
we wait till people have, of majority or, or 18 themselves where they can decide if they want that information. So that's the one place where I think people have to understand we don't just allow testing because the parents just are curious about whether their kids have this mutation or that. Uh, that's not a proper use of testing. Um, but in preconception, um, one of the questions that came up, and this is very true in the Jewish community, of course, even more true in some Christian communities, is around the issue of abortion. That is, is it okay to, pre, to test preconception or actually uh, in utero is even more if abortion is going to be part of the management um, uh, uh, strategy, the medical management. And that in our modern society, I mean, that now has become part of people's personal decision-making. We don't have sort of a systemic way of handling that. But that really was the only powerful question um, that people had about preconception health testing. There were some other questions, for example, um, about things like sex selection and other questions, but they're really not what JScreen does or what we're talking about here. So around the kinds of issues we're talking about here, it's pretty settled that cancer screening is, is perfectly acceptable from Jewish perspective and from a secular perspective. I haven't really heard any significant um, ethical questions around that. The only one was around collateral knowledge. That is making sure that your family who all, when you get tested, that's information for your family as well. It, it, it says something about their risk. And so that needs to be managed sensitively because some people don't want to know their risk or that information has to be given to them in a sensitive way. They shouldn't just find out casually. So that, that's a collateral question, but it's an important one ethically. And then around preconception testing, you know, uh, the great example there that all of us know well, and this is Doria Shurin. And in the, these very orthodox communities, because they worry about stigma, that is, if I find out that I have some particular um, genetic mutation, maybe it will be hard to marry me off in that community. So they have created a system of anonymizing genetic risk so that we can know that if I want to marry, if I want my daughter to marry this particular uh, person, we can look at their um, risk anonymously and say whether they would be a good match or not be a good match. So that's a that's oversimplifying Doria Shoreham, which has been an extraordinarily successful program, for example, in, in virtually eliminating Tay-Sachs from the Orthodox community. But that's the place, it's only when you get into those sort of very Orthodox circles that we, we come up with another kind of uh, Jewish problem with, with uh, testing. Mm -hmm. Can, can I digress here for a second and, and address, there seem to be some other questions in the chat about um, discrimination that might exist in insurance. Um, and I was on the precipice of this because I got my surgeries done right when Obamacare was becoming the law of the land. And if I'm not mistaken, um, there was a part of Obamacare that directly related to this. It was called the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, and it prevents insurers from discriminating on the basis of genetic information. Um, and so uh, that cannot be considered um, obviously a pre-existing condition because Obamacare addressed that. Um, I do know that there are some, um, some uh, gaps in that, including I believe um, now there's a debate uh, about genetic testing for Medicare um, uh, people on Medicare, that you can't, you're not eligible for insurance to cover genetic testing unless you've already had cancer. So that's an, there's ongoing um, legislative conversations about a lot of this, but I think the good news is that some of those questions about whether employers, insurers can discriminate on genetic basis um, have been addressed. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So Gina protects against employment discrimination and health insurance discrimination for most people based on their genetics or even their family history. There are some exclusions like the military um, and certain employees of the federal government, um, but it doesn't protect against life insurance and long-term disability. Mm -hmm. So for some people who are, you know, especially if they're young and they're healthy and, you know, maybe starting family soon and they're starting to think about some of these issues, they may consider getting those types of insurances in place prior to doing genetic testing so that they don't run into those issues down the road. 
there are some state by state protections. So it depends a little bit about where you live. Um, but it's definitely something for people to consider. Um, and Medicare has been a battle with the genetics community for a long time. I think it's finally making its way up to Congress to see if we can make some changes. Um, but you're right, Medicare sort of doesn't want to look at genetic testing as preventive. And they have very specific rules about who they cover genetic testing for and under what circumstances. And they will not pay for genetic testing for anybody who has not had cancer themselves. Um, even if they've had five relatives with breast and ovarian cancer, even if there's a known genetic mutation in the family, if they have not been affected themselves, then they have the option to either pay for testing out of pocket or not do it. Um, and so, as you know, the technology has sort of really outrun a lot of the laws and protections that we have. And, you know, we know that things don't always move the fastest. Um, so our hope is that, you know, a lot of this will catch up with the technology and the, and the medical information that we have. Um, but it certainly is a, you know, a consideration and something that a lot of people are working very hard on. Just want to make sure. Um, somebody made a point in, in the Q&A that, you know, we've talked a lot about genetic risk for cancer. Um, and really, this applies to a lot of other diseases, that it's not the only risk, right? So our genetic contribution to cancer risk is one piece of the pie, but there's also things that we're exposed to in our lifetime, lifestyle changes, things that we breathe in the air, um, you know, things that we're exposed to during daily life that can also contribute to cancer. So there are things we can control, there are things that we can't, um, but it's not something that is necessarily written into your genetics. It's sort of one piece of that contributing risk, which is why even when somebody does a genetic test and they're completely negative for everything that we've screened for, we still recommend that they do all of their routine care, right? Somebody who didn't test positive for an increased risk of colon cancer on a, gen on a genetic test still needs colonoscopies, right? People who test negative for breast cancer related genes still need their mammograms. You know, you still have to go to the dermatologist to get your skin checked. So all that stuff still applies because there are other things that contribute to disease aside from just genetics, even though that can play a big role for some people's risk. I just, I just want to throw, throw something out about what you said earlier about affording uh, testing. I just want people to know that if you can't afford JScreen, JScreen does have a program to help people who can't afford it um, pay for it. So if that mm -hmm. was your hesitation, I recommend people go to the JScreen site and in the FAQs and in, in the frequently asked questions section, you can look up what to do if you can't afford it and there are programs there to, to help people who can't afford it. Yeah, absolutely. And if somebody you know has issues getting genetic testing, definitely feel free to reach out to us. We do have financial assistance. Um, you know, it's available across the country. So we do both our hereditary cancer testing. We also do reproductive carrier screening. Mm -hmm. So we haven't talked a lot about it though. Um, Paul did, you know, talk about it in terms of things like Tay-Sachs disease and other genetic testing um, that, you know, you might buy as a wedding present, you know, to mm -hmm. talk about the risk of having a child affected with, you know, one of hundreds of different genetic conditions. Um, so certainly, the risks for Tay-Sachs and, and other genetic conditions are higher in the Jewish population, but really they can affect any family. Um, so certainly we rec recommend it for people with Jewish ancestry, but we recommend it for anybody who's planning to have a child, regardless of background. Um, and to, I see there's some questions about Tay-Sachs. So, you know, Tay-Sachs is still, um, the carrier rate is still high in the Jewish population. Um, but the Jewish community has done an amazing job of getting the word out there and raising awareness about genetic testing. So the number of babies that are being born in this country with Tay-Sachs 
um, has dropped so dramatically. And in fact, there are more babies being born with Tay-Sachs who aren't Jewish than who are Jewish now, just because of the awareness and the genetic testing that's gone on in the Jewish community. Um, now, if you know somebody was tested 30 years ago and they weren't a carrier for Tay-Sachs, again, their genes never change, but for their children now who are planning their families, it's not just about Tay-Sachs. We test for hundreds of different genetic conditions. Um, so, you know, just because your parents had normal genetic testing back then doesn't mean that you shouldn't have, you know, new and updated testing now. And we actually even recommend that people check to see if there's any extra testing that's recommended between pregnancies or prior to any future pregnancy. Um, all right, it looks like we only have just two minutes left. Do either of you have anything that we didn't get to say? Um, or Allie, can you just remind us the name of your book? I'd be happy to. Um, Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, um, 30 Powerful Stories, buy it wherever books are sold. Um, and uh, it's, it's the stories of 30 women who have achieved um, some degree of success in their careers. And this is them telling their breast cancer stories. Amazing. Thank you so much. The uh, people have asked the J Screen website is jscreen.org. Um, if anybody for any reason wants to contact me, I'm easy to find. You can just Google the Emory Center for Ethics and find my uh, find my um, email there. But it's just my first initial and last name, P. Wolpe at emory.edu. Yeah, and I'm at Ali Rogan on Twitter. So if you have any, you want to have reach out to me, slide into my DMs, they're open. Happy to answer any other questions. And Ali, I also just wanna say, you know, I'm always amazed at just how nicely you're able to be out in the public and share your story and especially your recent good news. So mm -hmm. I think we're all sending you really, really happy and encouraging vibes for the next, for the next months. Thank you so much. I really and appreciate a, that. And apologies to all those whose questions we couldn't answer. Yes. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody so much for this important, uh, informative session. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, um, Emily. And I, uh, I, I want to add one more question in here because it came up a few times um, about people who are in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s, um, aside from knowing from children, um, should they be getting tested at that, this stage in life? Yeah, so what I often tell people, you know, in terms of should I be getting preventive screening? Should I be doing surgeries? Um, and that's a very personalized decision. Um, but what I often recommend is if somebody would is healthy enough in their life that they would treat cancer if it were detected, then I think it's worth doing testing and cancer screening. Great. Again, thank you all for joining us. Um, as Ali said, her book is Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss. You can visit jscreen at jscreen.org. Um, and we will be sending out an email later this week that will have links to both uh, the book and the website. Um, and I, I guess uh, Paul said there's a lot of questions that didn't get answered. Um, maybe Emily and I will get together and figure out if we can get some of these questions and, and have that those answers as part of um, the email that goes out later in the week. Uh, again, go to momentmag.com, um, and that's where we will have the program listed, um, posted uh, tomorrow uh, that people can share with others as well. So again, thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for joining us and thank our speakers, um, and we will see you next time. Bye, okay. everyone. Thank you.